from the literature, I, I've, I've looked at some papers, um, a couple of them have been talked about in brief already. Um, how many of you use Twitter by, by any chance? So just roughly like straw poll, yeah. So, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, how many of you would use it for like med ed and stuff, you know? Yeah. So how peer reviewed is it? It's not, it's bollocks, most of it, in terms of if you've got 10,000 Twitter followers and you're active, you're, you're an opinion. Now, some of the guys on there are really, really good. It's not me criticizing them in t total, but there's stuff that gets out there that's poor quality, that gets picked up by people who are uh, you know, interested or keen, gets circulated, um, and you guys, because you're busy, you, you lap it up. So uh, when I go through this, um, this is kind of how I would try and read a paper if I had time and go through it. Um, and I'm just maybe, maybe you're all good at this and you do it anyway, um, but, but just have a think about that when you go through, because I'm going to maybe present a different take on some things you've already heard already from other people on social media and things. Um, I, I like to think that I'm headlining. This is the style I made in, in, in Belfast when I went to see them, but uh, I, I don't think I am. I think I just got pushed back by everyone that didn't want to do the last talk of the day. So um, I'm going to talk about DKA and intravenous fluids. I'm going to talk a bit about the Paris trial and high flow and talk a little bit about status and levoteracetam, Kepra, uh, for, uh, for seizures. <laughs> I just wanted to show off that I could say it. Um, so the first one was... Uh, a paper from 2018, New England Journal of Medicine, um, fluids for DKA, and looking at different infusion rates um, uh, and different fluid types. How many of you have heard of this or seen this paper? Okay, so reasonable submissions, that's okay. But enough that there's still a few of you interested. So their rationale was, and I don't know if anyone's heard the author talk, but he was at the Archem conference last year. Um, essentially, cerebral edema that, that we see in DKA isn't due to fluid that we give, it's due to the disease process, um, which I don't think, I, I wouldn't argue with that, um, and that we may be doing more harm by restricting fluids. Uh, I guess the counter argument would be cerebral edema is due to the inflammatory changes, but maybe they're on a cliff edge and we come on and pour too much fluid in too quickly and we tip them over. So just to bear that in mind. But, but that was their argument for the study and why it needed to be done. Um, so it was children from 0 to 18, 13 sites, uh, the PCAR network, which is a US uh, pediatric emergency research network, and they had kids in DKA, and the numbers are on there just for your reference, but I think we'd agree that, that that's a population of children with DKA. Um, and their outcomes were, so this is the interesting part, so uh, they looked at children who dropped their GCS below 14 as a primary, their primary outcome measure. So though the theory and the argument behind it is cerebral edema, actually what we're measuring is dropping GCS below 14, which it doesn't take that much, in, I'm happy to be corrected, but it doesn't take that much to get your GCS below 14. So it's quite a sensitive marker of deterioration or clinically apparent brain injury. So this isn't um, confirmed on imaging. This is these children have de deteriorated neurologically or they've dropped their GCS. Uh, they then looked at some other things, so short-term memory while you're in hospital uh, and IQ scores at two to six months. So that was what they actually looked at. Uh, they excluded, so they excluded drunk uh, and intoxicated children, um, traumatic injury, pregnancy, um, GCS below 12, so children are already quite obtunded. So that's quite important. So this isn't your children coming in really with signs of cerebral edema or pretty obtunded. This is children who are pretty well coming in with DKA, if that makes sense, which is really important because that's already a slightly different population. To, to you know, it's, it's narrowed that down a little bit. And then, fair enough, children with underlying neurological conditions where it might be hard to perform the assessments. So I've got no issue with any of those. Um, I think they're reasonable. Now, this is the next bit I thought was interesting. So that was their exclusion criteria. But then remember, their primary outcome was dropping your GCS below 14. So they then said, well, exclude everyone that GCS was below 14 from the primary analysis. So actually, this study's inclusion criteria were children with DKA whose GCS was 14 or higher. So that is actually a really, really well population of children with DKA. So that's really important to remember because actually what this study is, is a study of different fluid regimens in children who are really well with DKA. I just keep saying that, but it's just really important. So they had 4,912 children. They excluded t just over 2,000. For uh, There is a breakdown. Basically, they had too much fluid. They've been treated for too long. They just, it, it wasn't, it's all transparent. They just, it was too late to get them into the study. 289 withdrawn by the clinician, which I couldn't find a reason for. So they might have been put onto fast hypotonic fluids and the clinician, the consultant went, nah, not having that, take them out of this trial. There's nothing to explain that away. Um, 101 
kids who are enrolled uh, three times or more, which is fair enough, uh, pre-existing neurological conditions, low GCS, uh, intoxicated or pregnant. Um, remember, this goes to 18, so it's not like the Royal. <laughs> uh, so this is the bit that gets interesting for us, uh, and especially here, I, I think, with our experiences um, of DK and things. So they had fast isotonic fluid, fast hypotonic fluid, so fast hypotonic fluid for DKA, slow isotonic fluid, slow hypotonic fluid. And their um, hypotonic fluid was 0.45%. So this is where the study, all of a sudden I'm interested. Okay, this is, a, this is something actually. Okay, uh, maybe they're well kids with DKA, but you're talking about giving them fast hypotonic fluid. Okay, so let's have a look. Well, what does that mean? Because that's what they called them. They called them fast and slow. I haven't dust on that for drama. That's what they were called. So a fast was 10 mil per kilo boluses, and you could give as many as you wanted. And then you replace half of their deficit, which was assumed to be 10% over the first 12 hours, and you replace the remaining deficit over 24 hours. Slow fluid, 10 mil per kilo bolus times one, so very similar to our uh, BPSED guidelines, and then you replace a deficit assumed at 5% over 48 hours. I'll come back to this, but I had a look. They do not tell you how many boluses were given in each group. I suspect there was very similar numbers of boluses. So even though it was in the guidelines, someone wasn't going and giving, you know, we gave 80 per kilo as boluses and then started them on this treatment plan. Uh, and it's a shame that data's not in the, in the I can even find it in my supplementary material. Um, so again, outcome measures. Remember, GCS dropped below 14, clinically apparent brain injury, <coughs> short-term memory, and IQ scores at two to six months. So my critique of it before I come to the results, it is a pragmatic study. So I am involved in emergency research, uh, which is why I've probably been given this talk. Um, that's the main reason. It's hard to do emergency studies. So I, this is a good study in its design. It got into the New England Journal of Medicine. That should tell you something. Yeah, that would be your other test. If you're not sure about it, reading the paper. If it's in a crap journal, it's in a crap journal for a reason. Okay, uh, and, and lots and lots of things are now available as open access. Um, it's, there's a move towards open access. There's nothing wrong with that. There are some really good open access journals, but you do have to be a little bit careful where you're reading things from. You wouldn't go and get your news from, you know, uh, some sort of clickbait off of your Twitter, Twitter feed, so why would you get your medicine from there? But anyway, so um, multiple sites in America, clear methodology. Their exclusions are pretty clearly explained and transparent. Um, there was no significant difference in the demographics or the severity data between the different groups and they didn't go and change their outcome measures, so they published a protocol, they were open about what they wanted to do, and they didn't move the goalposts once the study was done and they found something. Um, what I would say about severity, just so I remember, um, average pH in this study, you have to go looking for it, 7.16. So these are not uh, your sickest kids with DKA. Again, that's well buried. So not deliberately, I don't think, but it's just trying to define that population a little bit more tightly. Um, so it's not blinded. You couldn't really blind this study. I think it excludes the sickest kids. Again, I'm happy to debate that, but I think it excludes the sickest kids. And actually, the fluid regimens, we go back to them, they sound really dramatic, but actually we're talking about 36 hours versus 48 hours for your, your fluid. Slight difference in replacement. I think the hypertonic is interesting, but really, and the authors are quite honest about this in their own discussion, they're just trying to reflect the range of practice that's out there US more than Europe for DKA management. So we're not talking about, uh, I'm just gonna give a load of boluses, rehydrate my kid really quickly and get them out of my department. We're talking about still pretty slow fluids. So 48 children dropped their GCS, so below 14. So we're getting really small numbers in terms of your primary outcome. Um, 12 children only had a, had a clinically apparent brain injury. Mean pH in those, if you go look in, it's seven. So it's, it's a different group already to, to the main population. Only three of them actually had a, a pH that reflected the main population. So sick kids get worse, uh, and, and there wasn't that many sick kids in them. But no difference between the treatment arms. So in this study, it didn't matter what fluid you gave, there was no difference. Other than the short-term memory was better in the fast fluid groups, no difference in IQ, uh, two to six months. So... Um, that study, it's interesting, um, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of come to my summary of it, but it's just an interesting one to look through and think about. So, you know, it is difficult to perform the perfect study. The fluid regimens really aren't that different between the groups. Uh, it reflects very much the mildest end of the spectrum that we see. Uh, it doesn't look directly at cerebral edema, but looks at deterioration in neurology. Um, I take home. So they sell this. When I heard it talked about, I came away from the talk 
being like, wow, this is a game changer. I remember talking to someone, this is, this is going to be change the way we manage DK. I can't believe how stupid we've been. All these dehydrated kids uh, who are struggling with their short term memory on the ward, uh, which is, never, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> that's kind of how I came away from it, you know, and, 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 he, and the, man, the work behind it is very, very good. And I, and I do buy into DKA. It's the inflammatory processes that lead to cerebral edema. But actually, let's take a step back and look at this another way. What we're doing here is safe. Our current guidance, there's nothing in this that says what we're doing is unsafe. Um, I agree with the statement about the cerebral edema. Um, the faster fluids in this study, yes, it has slight measurable benefits for inpatients, but who cares? It wasn't sustained at two to six months. Um, will it alter my practice? You know, probably not. And I think the group we haven't looked at is actually the highest risk group for cerebral edema. And I don't think we've answered that question. If I've got a kid in front of me who's really high risk for it, does the fluid regimen matter? I think what we've said is in children who are really, really well with DKA, who are really unlikely to get cerebral edema anyway, it probably doesn't matter about the fluids within the range of what exists normally. So this paper's nice because actually it's quite, I don't know who heard of it when it came out, but and you can, if you disagree with me, that's fine. We can debate it, but it created a bit of a stir and, and it still does. And it is a great paper, but it's maybe not quite as dramatic as it's publicized. I'll stop for a second. Has anyone, because I, I will rattle through these, but does anyone have any questions about that paper or anything they disagree with or? No, you don't want to take it on, that's fine. So uh, the other one, so we heard about the Paris trial already. So again, have people have heard of Paris other than, have you heard about it already today? So, so you, should, you have heard of it. Um, so again, same journal, so it must be all right. Um, and again, from last year. So looking at high flow for bronchiolitis. And again, a really good paper. Um, any of you that have read it or heard it, what's the take home? What was the message that's kind of out there for this paper? High flow's great, we should give it to everyone. So. Their rationale for this, pa this paper was essentially high flow is safe and effective. Um, and where should it be used in the algorithm? Should we be using it early or as rescue? Um, so this was children under 12 months of age across Australia and New Zealand in the PREDICT network. Uh, yes. Uh, who had an oxygen requirement. And depending on whether, they think it's, I think it's whether or not you're in Australia or New Zealand, that's 94% or 92%. Uh, and they said, so this is where, so when you design a study, you have to go to someone and ask for money for it. So you say, I want to do a study and I want some money. And they say, we're not going to give you the money unless you know you're going to be able to find something one way or another. So you need an endpoint. If you say my endpoint is ICU, death, length of stay, they're all, you need massive, massive numbers. So if you, you need to pick something that you're going to get quite a high number of things in. So they say, okay, that study is well designed and runnable, so we'll pay for it. Does that make sense? So they said, okay, we'll do escalation of care because we'll get loads of escalation of care. This is what I think, this is my own opinion. So uh, looking at it and having tried to get studies funded, I think this is what happened here. So they said, we'll put loads of kids on low flow oxygen, we'll put loads of kids on high flow and we'll see how many need escalated from low flow to high flow versus high flow to intensive care. And we think we'll be able to show a difference. Um, is that what you're interested in as clinicians? I don't think it really is, is it? It's not even a fair comparison, we're saying, low flow to high flow or high flow to ICU. We'll come back to that. The secondary outcome measures, which don't matter quite so much for the funding, are what's really interesting. So duration of stay, duration of ICU, duration of oxygen, intubation rate, adverse events. Uh, and again, we'll come back to this, but be careful about saying there's no difference in adverse events because it probably wasn't powered for that. Um, but anyway, so their exclusions, direct ICU admissions, cyanotic heart disease, reasons you couldn't give high flow home oxygen, all very reasonable, no problem. Patient recruitment, so just over 2,000 they could have recruited. They missed 500 or so, um, a couple of hundred didn't give consent. I would love to see how they did the prospective consent for an emergency study. That would be really interesting because that's actually typically now seen as, a, as an odd thing to do. By the way, your kid's really sick. Can we talk about research before we do it? It's kind of moving away, we tend to do the research and then ask for permission to use the data afterwards. Uh, and then about so just over 1,400 randomized and consented. So half of them got standard oxygen therapy uh, and the other half got high flow at two liters per kilo per minute. And 167 crossed over from standard care to high flow. So that's your escalation, if you like. Uh, and there's no difference between the groups in terms of demographic data or, or RSV status. They didn't look at disease severity as far as I can tell as a way of scoring, which it might have been difficult to do. So again, I think it's fairly pragmatic study. I think 
Um, we all have jobs and mortgages, and if you don't get a study funded, you're not going to be able to do the study. I think, I think the study design are not trying to be dishonest. They've had to find an outcome measure that they can actually do that's reasonable. There's no point saying I want the perfect study with a million patients, and I have this with my own project. Uh, I would like to do my study slightly differently, but it's not possible to do it within the realms of what can be funded. Uh, I think the methodology is clear, and they did publish the protocol. They've been honest about their exclusions, and the groups haven't really changed, and they haven't changed their outcome measures. So it's an honest study. It's not a dishonest study. There's just some flaws. It's not blinded. Very hard to blind this. Um, this bit I, I will leave with you. So this is, quote, not an industry-sponsored study, but all of the equipment and consumables were provided free by the manufacturer. I don't know what you think by that. Um, as I said, they weren't scored on severity. All sites routinely use high flow. So this is something that's really important. So these sites already all use high flow. So let's put that into context. You all use high flow already. We're going to give you some free high flow for this study. Um, and we want to see how many times you move from standard care to high flow. And if you're moving lots of kids from standard care to high flow, we might suggest that everyone just gets high flow. That's this, that's this study in a nutshell. Um, I know that's, that's probably how they got to their primary outcome measure as well. So primary outcome escalation. So how did they escalate the kids? So there's meant to be three of these four things. So you're on whatever treatment and your heart rate is not reducing, respiratory rate is not reducing, or it's going up. Your oxygen requirement is greater than 40% um, or clinical discretion. So clinical discretion is going to be one of the four points. You're not going to just say, I think they could do with high flow. We'll put them on high flow. You're meant to follow this. Uh, I'll come back to that. Which way would I go? I've done the critique, haven't I? Yeah. So 30% um, of them, I'll come back to 30% of them were escalated despite not meeting the criteria. So one in three children moved on to high flow anyway, even though they didn't meet the, the predetermined criteria for moving on to high flow. We've talked about the secondary outcome measures already. So primary outcomes, 23% of the group were escalated to high flow, 167 patients. 12% of the high flow, fly, flow group were escalated to don't know, doesn't tell us. So they could have gone to three litres per kilo per minute of vapor therm. They could have gone to CPAP. They could have just gone to ICU and carried on on two litres. Uh, we don't know. Uh, and that's, that bit would have been easy to do, I think, actually. They could have given us that information. Um, primary outcome, so it's statistically significant. So, so lots of children on low flow um, were, were escalated to, to, to high flow. That's not that surprising. Now, what is really interesting is 102 of the 167 that were escalated responded to high flow. So as a rescue treatment, perhaps it, there is something there. Now, this is, now this is getting into quite small numbers, isn't it? If I presented this study to you, would it get into the New England Journal of Medicine at this point? I'm not sure. If I said we put 167 kids on high flow and we managed to keep 102 of them out of ICU, you'd want to read that paper, but it'd probably be in something else as a journal. 67 of the ones that went on to high flow from low flow still needed to then go on to other care, ICU, CPAP, whatever, we don't know. 87 of the immediate high flow group went to ICU. So I could tip this the other way around and say rescue, now it won't be statistically significant, but I could say there's a non-statistical significant trend towards um, only using targeted high flow and that you'll keep more children out of ICU. Now that was probably nonsense, but I could take that same argument from the data. I don't think that's true. I think it's just a statistical anom anomaly, but it's important to look at that and say, you know, did they so really have they found any real difference? Probably not anything useful, we'll come back to. Escalation wasn't affected by RSV or um, status or age, was affected by whether or not you had an ICU on site. No ICU on site, more likely to get escalated. So it's this study, you start pulling it apart. It, it's not a bad study, it's not dishonest, but if you look at this on Twitter, the, the arguments out there, yeah, everyone needs high flow. Everyone should be on high flow. We should just start it the minute the child walks in with it sneezes. High flow. Not convinced this research really says that. As I said, 30% were escalated despite not meeting the criteria for escalation. Uh, secondary outcome measures, no difference. Now, be careful with this, because again, if this was a primary outcome measure, you'd be a bit more critical of it. You'd say, tell me about the power. This is probably not power to find any of these things. So there could be some difference, but we just can't see it because the study's too small. Again, I don't blame them for that. This is a, as big a study as you could, pro could probably do. Um, and again, for adverse events, so we say the adverse event rate is the same. It probably isn't powered well to find a difference when, you when you're only looking at an adverse event rate of 1%. 
in both groups. But from a pragmatic point of view, yes, it looks safe. So limitations, it's, this is research that was conducted in centres that routinely use high flow. Uh, a third of the kids were escalated without any reason. So it got randomised to low flow. And in my opinion, it looks like they said, I don't, like, I don't want low flow for this kid. I know I've put them in the study, but I'm just going to move them across because I, I'm on call. It's a DGH, it's Saturday, and I like high flow. And there's nothing to stop that from happening in this study. Uh, if you didn't have an ICU, escalation was more likely. You're like, yeah, you're like, oh, damn right, I don't want to transfer. Uh, and again, I haven't worked in Australia, but I'm assuming some of the distances are a bit bigger than what we're used to here. So you're like, I've sod the study, you've put them on high flow, I don't want to be doing a transfer this weekend. Um, it's not industry sponsored, but the equipment was given by an industry sponsor. That's industry sponsored. So really, end, of, end, end, end on end, does this just really show what people are doing in Australia with high flow? And I suspect what we see here is that you can give high flow early or late, and it doesn't really matter. I don't think you gain anything by giving it early. I think if you target it to children that you think would benefit from it as rescue, it's effective and it doesn't seem to be worth giving everyone high flow just to, you know, when you can actually spot them and get the same results. Um, but again, someone saw, there's an NNT floating around of nine, I think I saw. An NNT in medicine is, is phenomenal. You know, that's like, that's going to get that, that, whatever that is, that should be done for everyone if the outcome is meaningful. But the outcome in this study wasn't that meaningful. Um, that's, is that a slightly different take to what you've had on that study before? I'm not being, it's a great study and if I was the author of it I'd be very proud but, I'm, but uh, it's just interesting how we pull out the findings. So anyone want to ask any questions or comment on that? I've only got like four minutes left and then we're done for the day so well, well done for sticking with me. I know research is a bit difficult. Yeah, I said that already. So last thing, so there isn't actually papers for these two, so I'll be really short. So just to stick with me, it's just the things to keep an eye on, because I'm aware that's from last year. It's nice to look forward. So levotiracetam for, I'm just showing off now, for, for status uh, or for seizures, um, kind of two rival studies for so Eclipse, which is Peruki, um, which is UK and Ireland. And then we've got Concept, which is Predict Network, which did the um, work on bronchiolitis and high flow. Um, and essentially, is levotiracetam better than phenytoin for status? It's a good question to ask. Eclipse, so 29 sites, Pruki led, Belfast was involved, 286 patients. Concept, Australia, New Zealand, Predict led, 13 sites, 233 patients. This is the, just a snapshot from the protocol for the Eclipse trial. Essentially, you fit, you get treated for your fits with benzos. Um, you don't get better, so you either get levotiracetam or phenytoin, which is fair enough. Um, the concept study, so probably hard to see. I don't know if there's a pointer on this as well, or there is. So this arm is it's exactly the same. This arm you get phenytoin, uh, uh, levotiracetam, and this arm you get phenytoin. Assessment for phenytoin, 25 minutes. Assessment for levotiracetam, 15 minutes, if you think about it, because it's 10 minutes after that one, whereas this is 25 minutes. So there's a natural cessation rate for seizures anyway if you do nothing. So like, if you had an arm here, he said, we just won't do anything. Some of those will stop fitting eventually. So there's already an inbuilt in this study, uh, an arm to favor phenytoin because you've got slightly longer. Does that, does that make sense? Have I explained that? So they, that doesn't come out very clearly. And there might be a clever statistician who can work something out with that, I don't know. So at the minute, well, we don't know the results. But again, thanks to social media, don't forget the bubbles, conferences, uh, it's like a big open secret. So it looks like we're going to find that there's, well, probably no difference for Eclipse. They've been slightly more guarded with their results, which in hindsight was probably smart. And knowing the man that runs it, that, that makes sense. Um, so I think that will come out to say there's no, no difference. Concept, they said no difference, but I think they, we haven't got all their analysis done. So, so we'll wait and see. And they have got that slight issue in their study design that favours phenytoin. So will it alter practice? Well, levotiracetam, again, we've got to be slightly careful. These, aren't, these weren't designed as non-inferiority studies. that actually had to be slightly larger to do them. So it's not better in terms of stopping your seizures. It doesn't look to be worse. It can be given faster. It has fewer side effects. Um, we've heard people talk about this already. Um, for me, I would go with my department. So I don't want to be the one guy. Well, there was a time when I would have loved to have been the one guy who was saying, We're just gonna, I'm going to do this because I've read this paper and that's what I'm going to do. I think whatever you're used to using, I think over time we'll probably move to leave a Trastam because of its safety profile and we'll get comfortable giving it. And in five years' time, one of you who's relatively junior will be saying, we used to give phenytoin. Can you believe this? But 
again, it's not. Um, that's probably the most game changing of all the, of all the research, and it's still not quite. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thanks for sticking with me. I know that's a really hard sell at the end of the day. Um, any questions before I kind of close on and uh, actually close on time?